All right, so with my role at Site Affinity, I've been working a lot uh, with performance projects. People come to me and they say, hey, my site's running slow, or hey, my CPU is locking up, it's sitting at 100%, and we can't browse the site. Whether that's happening at a specific time of day or whatever, there's always a cause to it, and nine times out of 10, Site Affinity is not that cause. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with output cache and how you're handling things. So to explain the way Site Affinity works from this perspective, really .NET works from this perspective, there's really two steps that go into when you hit a page for the first time. So let's say you just deployed the project, you've hit the home page, so the application's gone through its initial initialization, but you haven't hit any of the other pages. If you were to browse to one of those pages and watch the network tab, it's probably gonna take anywhere from three to five seconds to actually load that page for the very first time. The reason is it's going through the compilation, so it's dynamically compiling the code for that page. And what I mean by that is the actual sitemap page that hosts that. It's compiling that, adding it to the global assembly or the temporary files uh, in Windows, and it's going to pull from that later. The second step is it generates the dynamic output, and it puts that into output cache. Output cache holds the actual HTML output for a given URL. Um, it is not the same thing as the, the compilation, and it's really completely two different things that you have to tackle when you're trying to handle uh, improving performance in the site. And we have two tools. Uh, one of them is custom, one of them is actually uh, delivered from Telerik, supported by Telerik. And those are the precompiler and the warmup. Uh, the warmup is just a script that I actually wrote, which is out on that uh, request links if you download that. I will tell you that I have deployed this setup to probably 10 clients in the past two months. And if you were to browse any of those sites in your browser right now, they would probably come in and under 200 milliseconds for the DOM, uh, which is very rare for a site affinity project unless you just went to a page and hit the refresh button because then it's already an output cache. Uh, essentially, what this requires, uh, there are some customizations oops, to this apply server cache method, which we will look at. That's also in the sample project. And you have to configure the output cache settings. So with output cache, the standard, Sitefinity is set to two minutes, which is a really short time for output cache. Uh, who actually knows to go in and up that when they are putting a project in production? All right. That is a very, very baseline improvement that you can make. Because uh, if you leave that at two minutes, every two minutes, if somebody comes and hit that page, it's gonna have to go and do all of its work over again. It won't have to do the compilation step, because that's still gonna be set in the temporary files but it will have to generate the dynamic output and re-put that in a cache and deliver it back. Uh, that will hit your CPU every time that happens. That is not the goal. If you're using output cache properly and you've set up your output cache settings properly, you'll have that sitting in there for the whole day if you have enough memory. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem because memory is pretty cheap these days. Uh, and you can go to the page eight o'clock at night, 3 a.m., whenever, and it should be loading up in under 200 milliseconds. To do this, let's go ahead and take a look at things here. Actually, just to point one thing out real quick. This site, out on Azure, is currently using that warm-up script. Uh, the only reason this location looks like it's taking a long time is because it's doing some JavaScript stuff, but if you look at the DOM, it'll come back really fast. Same for all these pages. I essentially actually set up a uh, warm-up script on a scheduled task that runs every three hours, I think, for it, because I only have 45 pages in the sitemap. And this goes through and keeps those pages in cache and makes sure that it's a warm-up so when anybody browses those pages, they're gonna be there. I'm doing it three hours, but I don't need to because I actually set my output cache to 24 hours, which there should be no concern with doing that. Uh, and this is why it comes back to cache dependencies and cache substitution. So if you have implemented cache dependencies correctly and it knows to clear the cache for your pages when a dynamic item gets changed, there is no concern with making your cache set to 24 hours, right? Because it's gonna clear that cache if something gets changed. The benefit there is, if somebody hits your page, it's set to 24 hours, it's gonna be there for the remainder of the day. Uh, now when IIS does its automatic recycles every night, uh, it will clear that out, but you can actually set 
that on a scheduled basis, so you have it set at 1 a.m., then have a warm-up script that goes through your sitemap, inserts everything in the cache again, and you're solid for the rest of the day. That is the end goal when you're setting up Outflow Cache and the warm-up service. And let me jump back to that cache setting. Just a note, I am not doing that warm-up service in the back end, so that's why this is running a little slow. You don't really need to. Uh, if you actually use, yeah, if you use the precompiler tool, uh, so again, the precompiler, that handles that initial compilation phase for pages. It goes through and does that. The warm-up handles the dynamic output generation. Now, if you're not using the precompiler, the warm-up will still also do the compilation. It'll just take a lot uh, longer for the warm-up to actually run, because it's gotta go through two steps instead of one. Uh, but you can actually use the precompiler to generate uh, precompiled backend templates for the entire backend sitemap. It's just a setting when you're actually running that script. Okay, so first, baseline setting when you're up, uh, putting a site into production, come in, Change that default output, co uh, output cache profile from standard caching to long. I've already done it here. This would say standard normally, and if you come in, it's set to 120 seconds, which is two minutes. It's really low for a production setting. And I've actually even gone a little further, and I set my uh, long caching to an entire day. That's what that 86400 is. Okay, and again, because I've implemented cache dependencies correctly, or I'm using out-of-box controls, there's no concern with doing that. A couple of the other settings uh, that I want to talk through here uh, that I would recommend turning on is this wait for output cache to fill setting. What this does uh, is let's say for whatever reason, and there are a lot of reasons this can happen, your application recycles in the middle of the day. So it's 2 p.m., IIS got recycled for whatever reason, and your site is now slow because it lost all of its cache. Uh, there's also nothing that's been compiled. Somebody comes to a page, well actually let's just say there's 20 users that are currently browsing the site when that recycle happens. That's gonna be 20 requests to that specific page all at once to try and compile it. When in reality, all it needs is one person to compile it and return that to everybody else. That's what this out wait for output cache to fill setting does. It essentially says, hey, we're taking one request. You other guys, we're gonna make you wait. They're not even gonna know that they're waiting. They just aren't sending a compilation request in and then we return that data back to them. What that keeps from happening and this is not checked by default, but what this does is if you were to have a recycle in the middle of the day, you had 20 requests going to a single page, it could lock up your CPU right immediately upon doing that recycle. Because that's 20 compilation requests, and if you have you know, 200 visitors on your site, that's 200 compilation requests all at once. A lot of them probably for the same page. And this allows you to mediate that. And again, your users will not know that anything different is happening. They won't even be slower. It's just not going to do multiple requests. It's just going to do one. Okay. So there's the, the initial settings you need to make on your output cache. Now let's talk about some improvements you can do from a code perspective. This is another thing where I don't know many people who know to change this. Um, some partners are actually modifying this for the user agent. Uh, but I'll talk through a little bit. This is the apply server cache code. Uh, this essentially is what gets hit when Sitefinity is initializing a page for the first time. It is telling it how to store that page in cache and what to do with it. By default, those are your settings. What that does and you may have seen this behavior, it also hits your CPU and it can cause performance problems. So switching this does help. Uh, every single user agent gets its own instance. Yep, sorry. Every single user agent gets its own instance of output cache. So let's say you ran a warm-up script and it is hitting it with Chrome. And then you come to the page and you hit it with Firefox. It's not gonna load up in under 200 milliseconds because it's still gotta go and do the dynamic output, the HTML. The reason for that is, is by default, every single user agent is having its own cache. By switching this value to just be 
false helps a lot because there are a lot of different user agents out there. Uh, and now, whether somebody's coming from Chrome or Firefox or IE or Safari or Opera or whatever, they're gonna get the same exact output that somebody else would. And in almost all cases in a Sitefinity project, there's probably no reason you need to have this set to true. Unless for some reason you're saying, if someone's coming to Chrome, we're gonna change the content to this, which isn't gonna happen very often. If it does, you're probably gonna do it using JavaScript instead. Okay. Now the next setting, uh, which has gotten a lot of people before, is this ignore params set to false. What this actually does, actually, I wanted that uncommented. This default setting is essentially saying that if I come to If I come to my history page and I do that, it's a completely different instance of cache again because it has a query string attached to it. And .NET is just assuming if you're attaching a query string to your pages that you are trying to generate some kind of dynamic output so it does not pull from the same cache. If I change, like if I were to refresh this then, this URL has its own instance of cache and it ha would have its own instance of cache for that URL. What is dangerous about that is if you have a client who's using Google Ads or have a client that's sending out newsletters and maybe they send out their newsletters at 11 a.m. and you notice at noon your CPU completely locks up. That reason is probably because those newsletters are attaching a tracking ID to the URL. You'll actually see it if you look in your IAS worker process. And every single one of those requests that is coming from each and every person uh, through the newsletter is getting a completely different instance of cache. And that's essentially going to hit the CPU every single time. Uh, now there are some circumstances where you may actually intend for this output not to be static. So let's say maybe you have a search feature in your site or maybe it's products and you're doing filter, name, whatever, cat, whatever. Obviously in this circumstance, we're probably gonna be changing a list of products on a page and we're filtering that. We don't want to retrieve the exact same output for this as we would for this. We can control that and you should. Inside of the supply server cache method, you have access to the sitemap node. So you can essentially look, hey, is this the products page? Is this the search page? And if it is, you can change the way it behaves. So you could say, if site node dot URL name cache.varyByParams. We're gonna tell it to ignore parameters. Sorry, sorry, opposite. We would set the default true. So let's show an example of this. We'll do else. You can even do an extra step here and you can actually pass on the specific parameters. Uh, that you want to vary by, but for this example, we'll just do star, which means all. And really, you don't even need that at that point. So now, I can specifically say if I'm looking at the products page, uh, then I want to do dynamic output. If I'm not, then pull it from output cache regardless of what's attached to the URL. Uh, this is a, a hidden issue that a lot of people run into and they don't even know they're running into it. It's not gonna affect you quite a bit as much as the user agent change will, uh, but there are two optimizations that will definitely make a difference on your CPU and the speed of the site. 
uh, specifically even with the user agent one, you're actually going to see faster load times when you're looking at your pages. Okay, okay in a second here, I'm actually gonna get into the warm-up scripts and the pre-compiler, but I do wanna show one more thing that a lot of people run into and they don't even know they're running into it. Who is familiar with that number of recompiles before that pre-start setting? A little bit, okay. By default, it's set to 50, I believe. Uh, this setting doesn't come into play often when you are using site sync, when you have multiple environments and your content editors are working in staging and syncing, because it's gonna batch all those changes. But if you have a site where your changes are being made directly in production and you're making them throughout the day, uh, this can come into play. So what this essentially means is, in this environment, after 50 dynamic recompiles, it is going to restart your application, which means your output cache is gone at that point. And if you don't have your warm-up script to automatically run an application startup, then you're not gonna have that going and your site's still gonna be slow. What you can do is you can actually up this number to something that is really, really high. To be honest with you, the only reason it's there is for memory leaks, which if you wrote your code okay, you're not gonna run into. Uh, it only happens on, uh, when you browse the page. So if you change, let's say you went into a page, you hit publish, you went, all right, I messed that up, let me go back into that, you hit publish again. Maybe you hit publish five times throughout the course on one page. That's not five dynamic recompiles of that page. It's only a recompile if somebody comes and browses that page and it sends a compilation request off. Uh, so if you make five changes and someone's only browsed it once after that, that's only one dynamic recompile. Does that make sense? Uh, but I've seen projects where they have their sites in our productions. They have 10 content editors making changes and we were trying to figure out why their application was recycling during the day and this is why. Uh, what we're gonna talk about now is that warm-up script, which is out there on that project. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and open that up and just take a look at this. Desktop, and you're not seeing my screen here. Is it visible to everybody? Okay. Uh, so this is a modification of a PowerShell script. Uh, there's some out there that, I know SharePoint has a lot of PowerShell scripts out there for warm-up ready. This essentially just kind of improves upon that. Uh, it works off of a sitemap.xml file, which is beneficial uh, from a certain, or from a few different routes. If you were using like the, uh, who's familiar uh, with the warm-up tool that Sitefinity Steve put out there that essentially warms up the, the pages in the back end and the front end. If you're using that, it just goes through the sitemap pages inside of the Sitefinity back end. It does not go through every single URL. So if you're using multilingual, it's not gonna hit your multilingual pages. If you're using dynamic pages like news detail pages, it's not gonna hit those. Using a sitemap is beneficial over using just the, the regular back end pages uh, because you can actually access all the URLs in the site. And if you're using, I think, Sitefinity 8, you can generate one of these sitemap.xml files using the site mini, uh, sitemap generator tool. And that's what I actually did. My sitemap is used, uh, generated using that. So I created the sitemap almost no time at all. It spit that out. And all I'm doing is adding that to my project and pointing this uh, warm-up tool at that. It also does error checking, which is nice because we get a lot of requests for people saying, hey, do you have any kind of crawler tool that's gonna crawl my pages and Tell me if I've got 404 errors or any of that kind of stuff. This will actually go through all of the pages in the sitemap and if it runs into like a 404 or a 500 error, it will add that to the errors.txt file. Uh, very simplistic, it's just gonna be a list of pages and it gives you the status code for the errors ones. Okay. It's got a web request method which essentially is using .NET behind the scenes to create some web requests. Uh, we are telling it not to do caching, so we're setting an HTTP 
cache policy here, specifically around no cache, no store. So we shouldn't have browser cache to this. And we're essentially outputting the time that it is taking to hit that page. So we also get load times with this. Uh, theoretically, you run this the first time, you're gonna see really high load times. You run it the second time, if you've done everything right, you should see really, really fast load times. And then, if, again, if we have errors, we're gonna output those with a specific error code. This loops through the sitemap file. It checks for two scenarios. So let me show you a couple of different sitemaps that Sitefinity can output. Okay. So here's an example of a sitemap. The site, uh, sitemap generator actually output this, and it's not using just this location property. Uh, because this one outputs multilingual links. So we have these alternate URLs in the sitemap file, which essentially contains two URLs for this one page, one for French, one for English. And the site uh, warm-up script that I have here will actually check to see if you have uh, one URL or if there's multiple URLs inside that collection. And if it does, it'll go through and hit every single language. That way, every single page within the site is warmed up. And at the end, it'll output how many pages it crawled and how many errors it ran into, and then it'll do an exit zero so you know it was completed. And I don't know that I had this pointed to the same, uh, right location. This is pointing at quantum, so let's do this. Okay, let's come to our local test project here. And of course, I gotta initialize it. And we're gonna change the path of some of these things real quick. Let's come into Windy Summit. Uh, just a couple notes. I've seen some people who say, hey, I don't need this. We have a uh, a scheduled task inside of Sitefinity that takes care of this for us, which is great, uh, but if Sitefinity is failing for whatever reason, your crawler is then dependent on Sitefinity for that. This is completely independent. You can set it up on a Windows scheduled task instead of relying on Sitefinity scheduled tasks and ensure this is gonna run at the right times. Okay, let's take a look at our page here. So you're talking about from a uh, Azure Web Apps perspective, right? So we did just add, those who don't know, 8.2, we added support. What's that? Yeah. So Azure Web Apps, we just added support, I think, yesterday in 8.2. Uh, and as part of that, Azure Web Apps support what are called web jobs, uh, which is very similar to a Windows scheduled task. And the reason they did that is because the way the cloud works is you don't really want to have to log into a remote desktop after the fact and set up a scheduled task manually. So they added web jobs that kind of uh, make scheduled tasks as a service that you can install using a deployment script like Thunder or PowerShell scripts for Azure. Uh, but I have not set this up on a web job. I do know that with web jobs, I did a little research on it, you can run PowerShell scripts. So it would work. Uh, what you would do is this in your deployment package, you would include this warm up script as part of the actual application. That way it's deployed and you don't have to go out there and manually do it. All right, so let's go ahead and run this. And let's see if anything blows up on me. <clears throat> and obviously my site has already been warmed up here. But we can see that this is giving me every single page that it's hitting, so all the news detail pages. It's telling me that I crawled 46 pages from the sitemap, and it's giving me the time that it's actually uh, hitting back for that uh, crawler instance. If I run it the second time, Again, mine was already warmed up, so I'm not gonna see too much of an improvement, but every single page is underneath 200 milliseconds. And the reason for that is is because it is retrieving it from output cache. If I come in now from IE or Firefox, it should be getting that exact same response because I modified that user agent property in my local project. Now, if you set this up so it runs daily, uh, it should work just as well as if you set it up to run every three hours. If you set your output cache to be for 24 hours, uh, what some people will actually do is instead of having it set on a scheduled task to run repeatedly, 
I'm kind of OCD like that. I want to make sure that it's actually in cache consistently. Uh, but you can set this script to run on an application initialization. Uh, so as soon as the application is deployed or as soon as the application is loading up for the first time, you can actually have it go through and do a warm up process like this. And that's actually, you can do that using the uh, application initialization module in IIS. So I'll look into that. I do want to point out an issue with this. Is anybody using PowerShell scripts or any kind of crawler task to warm up their pages and their current production sites? Okay. Uh, there is an issue, and this actually causes an issue not just with PowerShell scripts, but in general. And this is actually a .NET issue, not a Sitefinity issue. And it's with this global.asax file. A lot of people, I'm sure I'll get hands here, who's created a global.asax file in their projects? Okay. This is so that you can hook on to some application startup stuff. Uh, maybe you're registering, in this case I'm registering a route. When you create that file, you have all of these methods that it automatically adds to the file for you. This one in particular is the culprit, uh, but if you have that empty method sitting in your project and you run that warm-up script, you can run it again and again and again, and it's still gonna be back slow every single time. This is actually an issue that I found recently uh, for a couple of clients who have a lot of pages and it was really important to them to do a warm up process and the warm up process was not working. And that's because they have empty methods in their global .cs file. This is documented too on .NET as an issue if you wanna look that up. Easy solution, comment them out or delete them. Don't need them. You do that, one warm up script, it will run super fast. And I encourage you actually just to know that I'm telling the truth Try it with those methods in there, and then try it with those methods not in there, and you'll see the difference. It, it has something to do with that session start. It has a conflict with output cache. It'll still do the compilation, so when you run it the second time, you'll think that it's in cache, because it's like, well, the first time it was 6,000 milliseconds, the second time it was 600. But it should actually be more like 50 or 100. And the reason is, is that 600 milliseconds, it's actually still going doing the uh, dynamic HTML output part of loading that page every time. Okay, so that's one important thing I recommend doing if you're going to look at warming up your site. My understanding is if you're doing something in the session start, uh, it's not going to be an issue. Now let me preface that with, if you have a user who is logged in on a site and a Sitefinity project, output cache does not work. And that's intentional, uh, because what they do essentially is, if somebody's logged in, we're assuming that the experience is tailored to that user. Uh, and there's no way within the current caching system that you can differentiate that. So if you're starting up a session and giving somebody a, a session key or something in that session start, it, it is still not going to work because you're setting a session for that user. If they have a, a session, then essentially output cache isn't gonna be uh, being utilized. Any questions on that? Okay. <clears throat> Who's using our precompiler? Actually, first let me point out, if you want to download this, first just Google Sitefinity Precompiler. So this would be the first result. It's kind of hidden. We have a download the file right here. Uh, this is a exe file. It is command line. So you essentially provide it. Uh, if, you're, if you're using Windows authentication in your project, you have to use this. Most people aren't, uh, and they're fine with this first command line but essentially you just call the uh, exe file, you pass in the URL for the site. I do recommend doing this over localhost. So if, let's say uh, you're doing this in an Azure deployment. You would want to uh, deploy it, or run the precompiler locally, deploy those files with the package. Because if you put it out there and then you deploy it, it's gonna run a little bit slower because it has to go back and forth between things. Uh, plus with an Azure deployment, it's kinda hard to deploy an exe file and set it up to automatically run uh, when it starts up. So do it localhost. All it does when you run this tool is it outputs DLL files. You'll actually see 
Let's see if I got one here I can show you. Uh, but essentially what you'll see is it'll add a bunch of extra DL files to the bin folder here. And it's going to be telerc.sitefinity.frontend.precompiled.0.1.2. Essentially what it's doing is it's going to create multiple DL files that gets deployed to your bin folder. And it's segmenting these out depending on how many pages you have. You can actually control that. Uh, there is a pages per assembly properly right here. By default it's 1,000. So most people are probably just going to have one. Uh, but if you do have like 20,000 pages, then you'd have 20 DLLs. There's no problem with that. It's going to read that. Uh, the only difference is it's going to take a little longer to deploy your project because it has higher file size to do that. What this actually, uh, this tool actually does, you can, you can control the strategy here, whether you want to do the front end or the back end. You can do the back end too, and that'll actually speed up the back end process. Uh, but it actually goes through your sitemap, not the sitemap XML, the actual Sitefinity sitemap. And it goes through each page individually, and it pre-compiles it. And what I mean by that, and this is how it's different from the warm-up, is a news detail page does not exist in the actual Sitefinity sitemap, right? Because it is using whatever page is hosting the news widget. That news page is the actual sitemap page that's getting compiled. And it's compiling the controls that live on that page. And it's putting that in a DL file. And then when somebody hits that, it's pulling that compiled code from the DLL, it's re uh, rendering all the dynamic output, and then it's putting in the cache. So this is taking care of that first step for the sitemap pages. Uh, this is something you can actually, we recommend hooking it if you guys use continuous deployment or any kind of continuous delivery in your projects. You can hook this up to like Octopus Deploy. So immediately upon deploying or before deploying, you run this, you pre-compile it, and then you deploy it. That way when you get out there, all those DLLs are already deployed as part of the, uh, the package. Uh, there's no concern, where am I going on time? There's no concern with this if you go in and actually update a backend or a Sitefinity page that day. Uh, essentially all that's gonna happen is it's just gonna recompile that. This precompiler stores the page version in those DLL files. And it actually checks the page version when you go to it. So it knows that if the page version uh, the current one that exists in Sitefinity does not match the one that's in the DLL file, it will not use that and it will recompile it for you. Now, if you've gone a week, you've made 100 changes to your sitemap, you probably want to go and rerun this again. Any questions on the precompiler or how it works? This isn't something I see every project needing, uh, but I do recommend every project having a warm-up script. Uh, yeah, to a certain extent. Let's say you have 20,000, I work with a client, they don't have 20,000, but they have 9,000 pages in their sitemap.xml file, a lot. And they're using the warm-up script to just go through each one of those individually, <clears throat> but the problem is, is when they're doing that, it was also going through and compiling those. So their warm-up was taking like, I think it was like four hours to go through every single one, which is a lot. If they were to first run the precompiler against just the sitemap, that's going to kind of take care of that before they even run the script, and the script's gonna run a lot quicker. That's the real benefit, and again, that's not gonna take place on a lot of projects, uh, but at the very baseline, if you guys do look at continuous deployment, you might as well do this. It's a very easy thing to set up if you're setting up continuous deployment. You just call the script and you're good to go. Any other questions on that? I've got about 24 minutes here. I'm gonna very quickly just discuss what I've done around Feather with this sample project, and then we have a talk, uh, just a quick one on Azure, some of the things we su uh, support there. But 
in this project that I've delivered, this feather sample, uh, there is the code necessary to have feather registered in a separate assembly. So if you want to have a group of MVC widgets that are living in a separate project, you don't want to put them in the Sitefinity MVC folder here. You can set your project up similar to this feather sample. The big one that's really controlling all this is this controller container method or property right here on the properties that a, uh, or assembly info.cs. That's really what tells us that this control, uh, this project contains controllers. Now there's a couple uh, undocumented problems with this that I wanted to talk through real quick is if you actually have razor views, which you probably will if you're using Feather in a separate assembly, by following our documentation, you will have no IntelliSense, which means you will have squiggly lines for model, everything across the board here, squiggly lines for all of these helpers, and they will not work. Uh, let me rephrase that. They will work on the front end, but you won't be able to really use them. They're kind of useless at this point in your code file because I don't know about you, but writing Razor, the whole point of it is I can quickly do it with IntelliSense. That's kind of the purpose of it. So the solution to that is there's a couple of them. Uh, you can get these, this model tag initially just to register itself. Uh, very simple by adding a web config to this separate assembly, which sounds a little strange because it's not really its own hosted application. Uh, but by doing this, you're gonna be able to use those uh, MVC helpers and those Razor uh, uh, code that's sitting out there. What I recommend doing for this is, and obviously you're not expected just to know what to put in this file, what you can do, come down, copy the web config for your project, and then just remove everything other than these two sections. If you have these sections, you'll be good to go. So you can come into the web config, and you can see at the very top, we've got this section right here, which defines the razor. Now if we come down, we have this section right here, which defines the rest of it. That's really that's all, uh, all that's needed to get your IntelliSense working for that first piece. There is another issue with the IntelliSense, which this is actually more of a .NET issue, not a Sitefinity issue, is you need to come in and go into properties of your project, and force this to be in release mode. Uh, if your separate feather assembly is not set to release mode, your IntelliSense will still not work correctly. So two different things, add the web config, set the release mode, uh, set the mode to release for build. What's that? Sure. These will both be existing in your Sitefinity web config. You can copy them out, um, or if you just wanna steal the one that I have sitting in the sample project, you can do that too. The only thing you gotta be careful with is there are some versions in here, so depending on what version of MVC you're using, you'll need to make sure that gets updated. Any questions on that? I'm gonna jump into the Azure talk here uh, just because I don't have a whole lot of time to talk through the whole Feather sample. I, I'm just gonna point out one more thing. I think I'll still have time for the Azure talk. If not, we'll stay a little late. There are some of you, uh, some developers who are actually using their MVC controllers <clears throat> in a little bit of an undesirable way. Uh, they're using them for APIs. So they'll come into their uh, controller widget. Maybe their widget needs an API. needs to be able to easily call an AJAX request with JavaScript. And I've seen people actually just go, okay, well, I'm just going to do JSON result and get data. Right? They create a JSON result. This returns JSON back. They have their API. Cool. Problem with this is this lives on a controller. This is not conventional MVC. So I don't have one page where this route is living. This route is gonna live on every single page where this widget lives. So let's say this is a Twitter feed widget. If this lives on the home page, lives on the about page, lives on the contact page, whatever, I'm gonna have a new route called get data, get data for every single one of those. And it's gonna be called a little bit differently. It might be home slash get data. It might be about slash get data, right? When it's an API and you're doing JavaScript client side to get an AJAX request, you really just want API slash get data. That's a lot cleaner. You're not gonna have multiple routes. You have one route for this data source. You can use web API methods in your separate feather project. I have set that up. So if I actually came in, bam, 
Okay, that's my, uh, just my web API method. It's just returning a sample string. Nothing real complicated there. Okay. So don't use JSON results in your uh, Feather controllers or your MVC controllers. Set up a separate API for those uh, AJAX requests. 